So the title, Dinosaurs, New Visions of a, of a Lost World, is indeed a book that I have coming out to coincide with this 25th anniversary. Uh, the book will be published in September of this year. But I'd like to take you back to um, the, the meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology in New York in 1996. Uh, I attended that meeting. It was held at the American Museum of Natural History, shown here, which is on the um, edge of Central Park in the middle of New York. Many of you may know that. Um, and, and something was afoot. We knew something strange was going on. Um, during the meeting, the New York Times had a, a headline article headed, A Feathery Fossil Hints Dinosaur Bird Link, written by Malcolm Brown. And this talked about, this was the first report in English ever of uh, a dinosaur with feathers. Notice the date, it describes it in some detail, talks about, about the news of the discovery spreading quickly amongst the people attending this meeting. At the time, I was a very junior individual and wasn't directly involved, but I knew that something was going on. And it mentions towards the end of this paragraph, Dr. Philip Curry, who, who, who many of you will have heard of. And what was happening was that a researcher from um, the Paleontological Institute in Nanjing, which is called Nikpas, his name is Pei Ji Chen. He was at the SVP meeting and he was showing around this, a photograph of this specimen shown on the right. Uh, this is Nikpas 127586. His institution had just purchased it and they were trying to interpret it and, and uh, find support for their what they thought it was. It may be familiar to some of you. He'd shown it earlier at a meeting in Albuquerque, but it was this meeting in October 1996 in New York that really set it off. And the journalists were hounding him and we were, we were aware of this uh, excitement. How had they got wind of this? What was going on? In fact, at about the same time, published in Chinese, was a paper by G and G, entitled in English on the discovery of the earliest bird. And uh, here is an illustration of their fossil on, on the right. And this, this specimen is in the National Geological Museum of China. And in the paper, they very clearly uh, classify this as a bird, aves, uh, and they put it into a particular subgroup of birds and they name it Sinosauropteryx. So in fact, this is the, the name, even though they're calling it a bird. So what's happening here? Um, two years later, um, Pei Ji Chen here, uh, the first author plus others, published their account of this Nanjing specimen. And we've already seen that was the one that was being shown around at the meeting. Here is the Beijing specimen that was actually the type specimen then. This is the holotype of Sinosauropteryx. Here is the publication in Nature describing the uh, Nanjing specimen. But what's happening? This Beijing one, which is the type specimen, looks very like the Nanjing fossil. Look at them side by side. You could flip the two together, couldn't you? A skullduggery. In fact, these two specimens were part and counterpart. So bizarrely, the, the holotype or the type specimen is the Beijing example on the right. Uh, and, and automatically, without any wish from the people in Nanjing, their specimen is actually part of that holotype. It's, it's the opposite side view of the thing. And so those two, and they didn't know at that point, G and G were back home in Beijing. Pei Ji Chen was in uh, New York trying to work with uh, Western colleagues to understand what it was. Whatever happened though, all of this bizarre behavior, this was a frightfully important fossil because it is the first ever feathered dinosaur. But how could these two have been, uh, 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 how could this have all happened? And then what's been the impact on our thinking since this time? Because this is exactly 25 years ago. Let's take ourselves back to before the age of Chinese fossils. And some of you will remember those days before the 1990s. Of course, the most famous bird fossils up to that time were, were the examples of Archaeopteryx. Here's one of the specimens. And when they were first found around 1860, 1861, Thomas Henry Huxley uh, very uh, evocatively said, this is a dinosaur in bird's clothing. And so he, would, he looked at the skeleton, he recognized all the aspects of the limbs and, and the skull and the long bony tail. 
as exactly the same as many of the small um, theropod dinosaurs that were already known at that time. He knew the age, it's, it, well, he didn't know it was 150 million years old, but he knew it was from the uppermost Jurassic, the Solnhofen beds in Germany. But for a long time, that was pretty much all we had. Here's Archaeopteryx in the middle, dating to 150 million years ago. Huxley quite rightly recognized that it was in some way derived from these small theropod dinosaurs like Deinonychus here. And then we come through to the present day birds. So, so of course, Archaeopteryx is a bird. It's got feathers. It could fly. Um, but there were long gaps, particularly between um, Archaeopteryx as the first bird and examples of modern birds as fossils. So something like 75 million years of a gap all the way through to the late Cretaceous. Uh, and of course, many of you will be aware of the fact that this has meant that um, birds have been a great example of misunderstanding, both by evolutionists, some of course, who said, oh, somehow birds evolved very fast and terms like hopeful monsters and other strange ideas about evolution came about. And of course, creationists loved it because they could say, well, you know, if the paleontologists can't document the evolution of birds, what use are they? Obviously, birds were created as they are. They never evolved. Then fossils started to come out of China. We'll come back to Sinoceropteryx in a minute. But just to show you what the localities look like, those very first specimens, and indeed all the specimens subsequently, or pretty much all of them have come from North China. So in the map, we have Beijing is marked by the red star, Liaoning province is shown in pale blue, and indeed these um, Jurassic and early Cretaceous bird fossils and feathered dinosaurs are known from a large area over the north of China, uh, many of these provinces, in fact. Um, here is just one of the localities. This is a very famous one called Sihetun. Um, uh, dating to about 125 million years ago. And this one locality, this one locality has produced about a thousand specimens of early birds, Confucius ornithids. But indeed, many, many other locations are like this. They're, they're great thicknesses of thinly bedded limestones uh, interspersed with volcanic ashes and mudstones. And the, 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 the Cretaceous faunas are all within the Jehol group, the, 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 the group of formations, the Ishian and Jufoteng and a number of other formations. And the Jehol fossils are uh, uh, preserved in lake sediments. They include a whole variety of different kinds of organisms, including pterosaurs, dinosaurs, birds, and mammals. And the preservation is, is remarkably complete. The majority of the vertebrates are rather complete. Uh, here's a squashed bird with the wings and the bit of the skull here, the stomach area containing seeds, the long tail. They don't all have feathers, but the majority of them do have soft tissues and feathers preserved. Um, so here's Sinoceropteryx, the type specimen as named in 1996. The fact it was mistakenly named by G and G as a bird is neither here nor there. It was a unique new uh, genus and new species. Um, we now know, of course, and, and people at the time at the New York SVP meeting knew this was a compsognathid dinosaur. It's absolutely not a bird. But G and G, they were very convinced by microscopic study that these structures along the back and the tail were in fact feathers. They could see the soft tissue in the stomach area, remains of the liver and spleen. The, the black melanin in, of the retina preserved in the eye socket. And their assumption was, if it's got feathers, it must be a bird. And therefore they insisted that it was a bird, even though its arms, its forelimbs are very, very short. And that as Huxley would have seen, uh, he would have immediately recognized this is just like Compsognathus from the same late Jurassic sediments in which Archaeopteryx was found. Here's an early reconstruction of what um, Sinoceropteryx might have looked like. And you can note that they've given it a kind of stripy pattern over the whole body. And they've derived the stripiness, particularly from the tail region, which looks as if it is in some way stripy. Um, and, and, but are these feathers? This was the big debate. Because if it's a bird, then nobody would argue these are probably feathers. Look at them in close up. 
Um, some argued that point simply, dinosaurs cannot have feathers. Other people, of course, said, well, why not? If birds evolved from dinosaurs, why should they not have feathers? And of course, that is the current and obviously, I think, correct view. But others said, well, OK, it's a dinosaur. We can't force this thing into being a bird. It's got absolutely the skeleton of Compsognathus. Therefore, they said, these cannot be feathers. They must be something else. And they said, oh, shredded skin. Well, that debate was there. Do we believe it or not? Well, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But for the doubters who said that you, ca you can't get feathered dinosaurs, more and more specimens were discovered. Some of you may remember back in the 90s and the early 2000s, every few months there was another astonishing fossil published in Nature or one of the leading scientific journals, and they were all coming out of China. Here's the second one called Caudipteryx, a very weird, oops, a very weird looking creature, almost like a sort of skinned turkey with these tufts of feathers on the wings and the tail. And here, the, here are the wing feathers in the fossil. And you can see these are not just little whiskery feathers. These are complex veined penny feathers, the, the fully developed contour flight feathers that we find in modern birds. Here's another uh, Microraptor. Um, and this one amazingly has wings, uh, fully developed wings, not only on the forelimbs, but also on the hind limbs, as well as this long bony tail. There is no doubt they have a long bony tail, just like a dinosaur. It still has teeth in its jaws, just as Archaeopteryx does. And in fact, this is not a bird. This is some way off. This is a cousin of birds. So it was getting harder and harder as the years went by to say these, these so-called feathers, look at them here in the fossil, these long uh, primary feathers, secondary feathers, the contour feathers, all the different feathers over the wings. It was getting harder and harder to deny and say, oh, these are not feathers. That, that was increasingly silly. Um, and of course, many birds were found. And, and I mentioned Confucius Ornis already. Here's a list of various feathered birds that were found, thousands and thousands of them. And we used to get excited about Archaeopteryx specimens. Uh, you, and, and yet look at this, Confu this famous Confucius Ornis with two individuals, a probable female and a probable male. Um, and of course, the, the, this changed our perspective on the origin of birds. So remember that earlier diagram I showed where you have dinosaurs, you have Archaeopteryx, then a long gap in time with nothing, and then modern type birds, pretty much. Um, now there's a whole sequence of uh, dinosaurs, here's Archaeopteryx, and early birds. So the, uh, uh, it, here's Archaeopteryx in the evolutionary tree. The Chinese deposits were producing all kinds of fossil birds that are of the same age or slightly younger than Archaeopteryx, as well as all kinds of dinosaurs with feathers of different kinds. Some of them like Microraptor that could probably fly, many of them probably that could not. And in the course of the, the, this filling out of the evolutionary tree, this, this answer to the creationists, well, if you don't like what we've shown you so far, have a look at this. Here's hundreds of thousands of specimens that illustrate a lot of the evolutionary points along the way between dinosaurs and birds, and then between Archaeopteryx as an early bird through to modern birds. And the 30 unique characters of Archaeopteryx and birds that, that we used to talk about in the textbooks, hollow bones, the presence of a fused clavicle, the wishbone, specialized bones in the hands and the arm related to flight, the fact they've got three toes, you know, the standard bird footprint, feathers, of course, and feathers of different kinds. They've all gone down the evolutionary tree. Yes, they're all present in Archaeopteryx and all birds, but they go back down the evolutionary tree because all these earlier forms, they have feathers, they have all sorts of other bird-like features. Uh, <clears throat> and now we can look at this evolution of birds in enormous detail. We don't need to worry about all of the detail here, but just to have a look at the, the sort of total knowledge. This is the evolution of dinosaurs from 240 million years ago in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Triassic. Uh, here's into the Jurassic at about 200, 150, 145 into the Cretaceous. So all these different um, theropod dinosaurs, and then finally birds in the top corner here. So there's an enormous amount of detail, and it's been possible to do um, substantial study of exactly what was going on. 
I've marked with orange blobs, so-called monsters, by which I actually mean giant theropods. So here we have T-Rex up at the top. But you may know that at different times, other groups of flesh-eating dinosaurs became gigantic. Carcharodontosaurus, um, Giganotosaurus, Spinosaurus, uh, somewhere down here, Abelisaurus and the South American forms. <clears throat> so something unusual was happening in the origin of birds because they got smaller. So whereas normally these were getting larger, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with the origin of flight, the birds were getting smaller. And it now seems, thanks to a paper published by Pei and colleagues last year, that um, actually many of these reduced size, dwarf size um, theropods were, were becoming flyers. So <coughs> the ones shown in brown could fly to some extent close to powered flight. But in green, we have powered flight potential. So here's Archaeopteryx and birds at the bottom. But the Anchiornithines, which are close relatives in green, Microraptor, you've seen that already. Another group up here, Rahanavis. There's this weird looking thing here, the Scansoriopterygids. This is E. Chi, the dinosaur with the shortest possible name, with rather weird bat like wings. <coughs> and so it seems all of these were capable of powered flight. Now, what have we learned from these in terms of not, not only the evolution, but in terms of dinosaur function and paleobiology? So this is where I became involved back in 2010, so 10 years ago. We published this paper where we announced uh, for the first time ever that we had determined color from dinosaur feathers and indeed from bird feathers that had been hinted at, but not done in a thoroughgoing manner. So what does this really mean? And some of you will know the story, some of you perhaps not. But it's important to understand what this was all about. This was when a lot of uh, our understanding of dinosaurs was becoming more and more scientific. Let me defend that statement. Of course, this raised a great deal of publicity. Uh, uh, here is our dinosaur. This is our reconstruction of Sinoceropteryx, which is ginger with a stripy tail. And another group at about the same time were working on Anchiornis, one of these other flying forms, but a dinosaur. Uh, and they came up with this fantastic black and white stripy pattern on the wings and, and a gingery crest. And so how did we do it? What were we doing? We were, we were saying something very definite. We were saying this reconstruction or many other published reconstructions, paintings of Sinoceropteryx were incorrect. Uh, whereas this one is correct, the ginger pattern with the stripy tail. And we're not just saying you'd better believe us because we're professors and we're important, therefore we're just telling you this is correct and this is not correct. We're saying we have evidence that this is correct. And the evidence comes from structures called melanosomes, uh, which are buried deep within the structure of a feather. So if you look at a zebrafish, which has a number of different colors of feathers, it's got black and, and gray colors and dark brown uh, and off-white, a sort of blonde color and white and ginger. All of these colors of the feathers of the zebrafish and indeed all other birds that have these kinds of colors are uh, produced by pigments called melanins. And there are two main melanins that are found in vertebrates. There's eumelanin, which is the commonest one, the one we normally think about as melanin. And that gives all these varieties of blacks and browns and grays and blondes. Uh, <clears throat> and and the, the, the tone, the shade is, is more or less depending on the uh, amount of packing of those melanosomes. And eumelanosomes are shown here at the bottom on, on the left-hand side. This is a photograph under a scanning electron microscope. The scale bar, the white bar in both of the photographs is one micron, that's a millionth of a meter. So this is about the limit of magnification of a normal scanning electron microscope. And you can see the eumelanosomes are very definitely sausage shaped. So when you look, if you take a feather shown at the bottom right of a zebrafinch, this one is from somewhere in, in the cheek area with, with ginger and black and white, various colors. In the black area, this is what it looks like. It's packed with eumelanosomes. Whereas in the gingery part of the feather or the ginger cheek area, um, the, the, the melanosomes are spherical, quite different in shape. And, and look at the size. They're, they're somewhat shorter. They're about half a micron. These are 
up to a micron. And these are called pheomelanosomes, and they all they come from pheomelanin, which is chemically different, a different kind of pigment than eumelanin, and it gives ginger colors. And in fact, the colors of, of hair in human beings are formed of those two kinds of melanin. So people with ginger hair uniquely have pheomelanin. Other people have eumelanin. And the two can be combined. The, the two can occur together. And the, 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 the pigments are produced in the skin. And when the hair or feather emerge from a follicle in the skin, um, the pigment is injected into the structure of the feather or the hair. And it's encapsulated within these structures called melanosomes. So they're like pigment capsules, tiny, tiny pigment capsules. And the amazing thing is they are preserved in the fossils. So when we look at the feathers or feather-like structures of Sinoceroptrix, here's that Nanjing specimen again that we saw right at the start. We weren't allowed to take samples from that, but we took samples from a different specimen from these tufts of feathers, this shows up very nicely. We have tufts of dark and pale in the tail. Notice dark colored crest, a sort of Mohican crest down the top of the head, down the middle of the back and, and then stripy tail. When we looked at these under the scanning electron microscope, all we saw were spherical melanosomes. Uh, and in many cases, just the molds, the, the, they had sort of broken out, but here and there, the spherical structure. So just to go back, here they are from the modern feathers of a modern zebra finch. Notice spherical, sausage shaped. These are failed melanosomes indicating ginger color. We looked at many samples from all through all over the body. This proved two things, of course. These structures contain abundant melanosomes within the structure, embedded within the structure. Therefore, it proved what well, firstly, these are feathers as we had long thought. The naysayers who said that they were shredded skin were frankly wrong, because generally you don't get melanosomes in skin. The, the melanin just floats about within the skin. If you have dark colored skin or get sunburned or have freckles, that is you melanin within the skin. And it doesn't tend to occur in melanosomes. So this is what we call a chain of inference. We look at the fossil, we analyze the fossil, we find a structure, we compare with the situation in modern birds or modern animals, and we come to a conclusion. And this is testable, this is the key thing. Therefore, we can say it is scientific. Anybody who doesn't like what we said back in 2010 can look at another example. They can look at any specimen they like, it doesn't have to be the same one. Or they can look at feathers of modern birds or hair of modern mammals, and they can seek to disprove it. They could say, well, actually, Haha, <laughs> these shapes of melanosomes are only found in zebra finches. If you look at other birds or mammals, it's totally different. In fact, as far as we've been able to find, and thousands of people have looked at many, many different species of birds and mammals, you always get this relationship. The, these colors, the eumelanosomes, uh, the sausage shape always goes together. The ginger, the pheomelanin, the, the spherical shape of the melanosome always goes together in mammals and birds. And the fact that it is in mammals and in birds allows us to generalize this uh, observation and say, the likelihood is if we find these structures in almost any fossil vertebrate, uh, because they occur in both mammals and birds, which in evolutionary terms are widely separated in the evolutionary tree, dinosaurs are included between the two. And therefore, it's reasonable to suggest that this would be the case. Here is, for the first time ever shown in public, a modern reconstruction of Sinoceroptrix done by Bob Nichols, uh, the, the, the best paleo artist currently working, based in Bristol, uh, his firm Paleo Creations. Uh, and this piece of artwork includes a lot of new information. But certainly, all of the information we had back in 2010 plus newer research uh, by uh, Jakob Winter and uh, Fian Smithick and others, showing that also uh, Sinoceroptrix has counter shading. So it's got this pale underbelly and a so-called bandit mask, this sort of dark flash around the eye. Uh, and it is a predator. So this one is looking happy because it's grabbed a lizard. Why did we have this new artwork done? This is one example of many. This is featured in our new book, um, to be published in September 2021, Dinosaurs, New Visions of a Lost World. 
And our purpose is to bring you up to date on this very new area of paleontological research, determining the color of fossil animals based upon evidence. So we're actually showing examples where we can prove that they are these colors, or at least people could test and disprove what we're saying and illustrated lavishly by these wonderful, wonderful artworks by Bob Nichols. So I'm just going to show you a couple of others before, before I draw this to a conclusion. Here's his amazing reconstruction of Sitacosaurus. You may have seen paintings like this uh, a couple of years ago when he worked with Jakob Winter and other researchers in Bristol, um, looking at the evidence for counter shading in, in Sitacosaurus. Um, <clears throat> which is a dinosaur, a herbivorous plant-eating dinosaur, in evolutionary terms, a long way from birds. So in a sense, we're extending the range of how far can we go in determining color. And we would say, well, we can go quite a long way. So here's this armored dinosaur. Here's mum with a group of babies. Uh, Cetacosaurus famously has these weird feather-like structures along the, the middle of its tail. Um, and, and here are examples of Cetacosaurus juveniles. Um, the, this, this top photograph shows a cluster of babies. <clears throat> the scale bar, I think, is 10 centimeters. So each of these individuals is, is only about 20 or 25 centimeters. That's about one foot long. It would nestle very comfortably in your hands, about half the size of a cat. These things are only two and three years old. And you often find them in clusters like this, amazingly preserved within ash. So the whole story of these fossils is quite extraordinary. They come from a locality in Liaoning province, uh, Lujia Tun, which means Lujia village. Uh, and and it is, it's sometimes called the um, Chinese Pompeii because it seems these poor creatures were uh, uh, overwhelmed by falling volcanic ash. And hence they're, they're beautifully preserved in clusters. But it showed us that the babies sort of stuck together, lived together. Um, and here is the famous Senckenberg specimen, which is in a museum, the Senckenberg Museum in, uh, uh, in, in Germany. And this one is very unusual. It's not preserved in the ash, but in different kinds of sediments where soft tissue, stomach contents are here, the outline of the skin, scales you can see here in the shoulder area. The dark color is melanin within the skin and melanin from the internal organs. And along the tail, you can see maybe just patterns of scales. You can see the sweep of those feather-like structures along the backbone. And uh, this was earlier artwork by Bob Nichols based on the research by Jakob Winter and others, uh, reconstructing. Here's the spotty uh, pattern around the shoulder area, the spotty scales, the dark scales along the tail. There's a certain amount of counter shading underneath. These quills along the back are, are very likely analogous to feathers. Here is the thing drawn in all different views. Uh, and, and this was quite unexpected that you could, you could get such detail of the color and, and that the quality of the skin. Uh, so here we're looking not at feathers giving the color, but at the skin, in fact. And here again is that astonishing artwork. And some of you who are alert to the news may have noticed that Jakob Winter published a paper just before Christmas giving some detail of the color of the cloaca of Cetacosaurus. I won't say any more than that in case there are children listening. We can extend this to pterosaurs. So here's a study that we did a couple of years ago. This may be surprising. Pterosaurs, of course, are not dinosaurs. They're cousins of dinosaurs, and they've long been known to have been covered in insulating whiskery structures, which technically are sometimes called pycnofibers. And the word pycnofiber was invented so that there was a term <clears throat> for these hair-like structures in pterosaurs because we didn't really want to call them hairs or whiskers because those are terms we use typically for mammals. Nor did people really want to call them feathers because these are not birds or dinosaurs. Birds or dinosaurs. These are pterosaurs. So this is an a neurognathid um, pterosaur, not a very big creature. This is about the size of a pigeon or just a little bigger. Uh, 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 it's an aneurognathid form uh, from Inner Mongolia, and, and um, I did fieldwork there. I was privileged to do fieldwork there with um, a group from Nanjing University, led by Jiang Baoyu, and we had a fantastic and crazy time in Inner Mongolia collecting fossils like this and rich fossil insects and other amazing fossils from the end of the Middle Jurassic. 
And what can we say about this? I've, we've shown the color, we've shown that it's a sort of brownish color. Is that guesswork? Well, no, it's based on melanosome within the pycnofibers. And in fact, when we published the paper in 2019, um, <clears throat> we called them integumentary structures with complex feather-like branching. So of course the titles of scientific papers tend to be slightly cautious, but we are essentially saying these are feathers. So up until this publication, people had thought that the only style of pycnofibers were just simple bristle-like structures like this. But then we found examples where they had a brush-like termination at the end, as shown here, or some of them even brush-like whiskery arrangements halfway down. And some of them seem to be completely fluffy right to the base, like a, like a down feather. And in fact, we compared these with all the types of feathers you find in dinosaurs and birds. And we could find that these are mimicked or these types of feathered like structures, these types of pycnofibers are also found extensively uh, in many different groups of dinosaurs. So we said probably pycnofibers are feathers because in fact, pterosaurs and dinosaurs are, are sister groups they're very close relatives. And here's Bob Nichols reconstruction of a very similar and Eurognathid with this pale browny yellowish kind of fur and, and a speckly uh, color. And this one's looking very happy because it's come upon a, a tasty looking lacewing fly that it's going to ca catch and eat, no doubt. Uh, but what about the giant pterosaurs? Because of course, these were the, the little bird-like ones that existed in the Jurassic. What about these crazy monster pterosaurs from the Cretaceous? Here's a weird and amazing thing called Tupandactylus. And when you look at the fossil, here, here's the fossil of the skull. It's, it's very hard to work out it's even a skull. This, this enormous opening here isn't the eye socket. When you look at the reconstructed skeleton, you can see that the lower jaw, so here's the jaw, it's got this enormous flange, pointy at the front, no teeth. Here's the jaw hinge. Here's the eye. The eye socket is this little structure here. And in fact, this enormous feature here is partly for the nostril but probably partly just to save weight, because of course any flying animal has to use every evolutionary trick it can to save weight in order to enable it to fly. And so you'll notice this ridiculously huge beaky looking skull with this great long uh, uh, thin bony structure rising and, and sweeping back from the tip of the snout, uh, long neck, here are the arms which sprout backwards as wings, here are the hind legs, so you can see how the thing can sort of walk along on all fours, that it's got uh, fingers on its, its hands and, and obviously the feet. And so the thing can sort of stilt along on the ground. And the fossil maybe gives you a hint of what this long pointy thing is for, that in life it would have supported a, a, a skin or integument like a sail, a membrane. And when researchers in Brazil studied the membrane, they, looking closely at this under the microscope, they discovered it, it contains melanin. And they were able, able to reconstruct a number of different patterns with pigment and, and patterning. And some recently even suggested that it may have been photoluminescent, meaning that it, was, uh, it would have been visible at night in the dark. There would be some retention of energy from the sun's rays. So these things could have flashed to some extent at night. And here is Bob Nichols's reconstruction showing the whole thing covered in pycnofibers necessary for insulation. These are warm blooded animals uh, with broad wingspan. And in fact, the skeleton, although this head crest is huge, as you saw, the skull is really lightweight. And so almost certainly this thing could have flown and it would have been rather odd if it did not because it's got very obviously large uh, wings and, and the area of the wing would enable it to soar and fly something like an albatross. The final story it, it comes from this rather ugly looking fossil deposit called the Athabasca tar sands in, in Alberta, Canada. And this is a huge area of open cast mining. These little dots on the roads uh, in the bottom left are enormous diggers and trucks. And so this huge area has been laid waste by the open cast mining. And indeed the white is snow. Uh, this is in the north of um, Alberta and is frequently covered in snow. And in 2011, a huge dinosaur skeleton was discovered in these Athabasca tar sands, aged in the early Cretaceous. And, and the specimen 
weighed about 10 tons. And one of the people involved was my former PhD student, Don Henderson, and he and others from the Tyrrell Paleontology Museum in Drum Heller collected it. And it took a huge amount of time to prepare the skeleton. And here it is, it's now called Borealo Pelta, Boreal meaning Northern and Pelta, some reference to the skin. And um, it may be a little bit hard to make out at the moment. Notice how huge it is. These are people in the background. Here's the skull. This is an ankylosaur, so it's a heavily armored dinosaur. The skull is here. Around the neck region are these pointed plated structures. And notice between the plates is a kind of chainmail armor of, of smaller osteoderms. And then spikes and prongs and, and, and quite substantial plates all over the back. The thing broadens out uh, and, and, and shaped almost like an enormous turtle. And here in a bit more detail is the fossil at the top right um, with the head at the left and, and that part of the skeleton and then the tail part that fits on at the back. And a drawing below B, figure B, is the drawing showing the different kinds of armor plates and, and the reconstruction of the various bits. So it was described and named in 2017. And not only then does it preserve these very detailed um, bony plates, the osteoderm, some of which are spiked and these enormous scimitar-like, sword-like structures over the hip, over the um, shoulder area. But between them are well-preserved bits of skin and even traces of the horn sheaths. So this horn, T1 in green, in life, would have been covered by um, keratin, which is protein like we have on our fingernails and, and also which makes our hair and feathers in birds. And of course, the horns of a cow or of an antelope or a deer are also covered in a horn sheath. It's not bone, what is bone, but it's covered in horn sheath. And those keratin sheaths contain uh, traces of the pigment that they would have had originally. And the tests done by Brown and colleagues suggest that it, they contained abundant pheomelanin, evidence of a ginger color. And so here is Bob Nichols's fantastic reconstruction of this amazing creature head on, showing this sort of gingery, sandy kind of color of this giant dinosaur, which probably weighed, weighed about five tons of life. It's not an amiable tortoise size of a creature. This is absolutely huge. It's more the size of a, a tank. Uh, and doubtless it needed this protective armor because there were, there were predators like uh, relatives of T-Rex and other monsters of the day that um, it would need to protect itself from. <clears throat> but it's been suggested these huge scimitar-like spikes could have imposed quite a wound on any predator. Failing that, the animal would just curl up and, and tuck its legs underneath and just wait out the attack. So to finish with, I'm just going to summarize that um, paleontology has moved on a lot in the last 25 years. We have exceptional fossils. We apply the principles of uniformitarianism, point two, which is we can look at structures like uh, melanin and understand how it occurs, what it looks like. We can detect it in the fossils. We can interpret it. In certain cases, we can confirm results from multiple tests. I'll just quickly show you an example of that in a minute. And we know these things about dinosaurs, numbers one to five. These used to be speculation. But now we can actually test these by um, so-called ch uh, chains of inference. And I've shown you how we know the color, and that's what this new book is very much about. But we know the speeds, the modes of locomotion of these ancient creatures. We know their uh, modes of feeding and their bite forces. We know how they grew. We have examples of babies. I showed you the Cetacosaurus examples, but didn't talk about how we can tell the ages of those babies by looking at the bone structure and other information. So very quickly, just that one point on multiple confirmations. Without looking at the details, uh, it's long been known that you can actually calculate the speed an animal is moving at by looking at its trackway. And here are some dinosaur trackways. And this chap sitting here looks quite happy, maybe quite relieved because he spent several days brushing off all the muck off this ripple mark surface. And there's a three-toed dinosaur running up from the bottom to the top. You can see the footprint. This is right, left, right, left, right, left. And so it goes. And there's another one coming from right to left here. And this is the left foot, the right foot, the left, the right, the left. So you can see it's striding along across here. 
And from the size of the footprint, we know the size of the animal that made the track. <clears throat> and from the spacing of the footprints, which here is actually quite close for such a large animal, it's actually probably moving relatively slowly. If this thing was really going full tilt, its uh, stride length would be double or three times what it is here. So there's, there's a formula over here. We don't need to go through the detail of it, but it allows us to work out speed. We know that it works because we, we've, we use it for many, many examples of living animals where you can measure the, the, the spacing of the footprints, calculate the speed, and then also you can measure the speed by uh, filming the creature running along. You can test that in this particular case, the big theropod is maybe going at 27. Well, probably not, it's a bit slower than that, but 27 kilometers per hour. That can be cross-checked by looking at other features of the skeleton. And John Hutchinson has particularly worked on this. He wanted to try to understand <clears throat> whether a, 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 a six ton chicken could give you a good model of T-Rex? The answer is actually, by the way, no. A, a chicken typically weighs half a kilogram. Here, here's the chicken. And this, this diagram from John Hutchinson shows the body weight on a logarithmic scale. So this is half a kilogram. This is one kilogram. Um, this, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, 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 10, this is 100, this is 1,000, this is, this is 10,000 kilograms. And so this is the six ton chicken. And in fact, the best running ability based on the, the volume of the leg muscles on the y-axis is only in this area here. So only really the chicken and anything up to about 10 kilograms would be able to fit in that area. And anything more heavy than that just could not be a fast runner. So this proves again that T-Rex could not exceed a speed of something like 27 kilometers per hour because it is just too huge to be able to be powered by the same kinds of muscles that a chicken has got. In terms of bite force, people have done multiple experiments to work out the bite force of different animals. T-Rex has an enormous bite force of something between 35 and 57,000 newtons. So that's something, like, that's something like four to six tons of bite force, um, uh, which, which however you look at it is absolutely huge, but it's what you'd expect. Much greater than the great white shark and the lion, and of course, much more huge than the, the human. That can be calculated then from a, 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 a digital model in the computer with reconstructed muscles shown by the red rubber bands and working out the strength of the bone and the nature of the function of that huge skull. And you can do the calculations and you can get the answer. And if anybody doesn't like that answer, if they say, no, 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 that's ridiculous, then you say, well, you need to uh, do the calculations yourself and show where we made the mistake. You can't just say, well, I don't believe it. You've actually got to step through the, the chain of inference. And, alter and that, that, that method has also been worked on by Emily Rayfield, my colleague in Bristol, using a method called finite element analysis. And the strong reasoning that she would give, which I fully accept that we should accept this kind of calculation, is that we do these kinds of calculations. Engineers have been doing these kinds of calculations for more than 50 years. Uh, for every aircraft you fly in, for every bridge, modern bridge that you go across, every high rise building that you go into, they were stress tested in the computer. You don't build it and then hope for the best in the medieval way. You make your model, you run it using finite element analysis, you make your model plane, run it using finite element analysis. Can we build the plane out of steel or aluminium or plastic? Or could we even build the aeroplane out of blue cheese? How would it react? And of course, you can run those experiments. You pretty quickly decide not to build it out of blue cheese. Uh, and uh, Emily Rayfield, a number of years ago, did the same experiments on T-Rex, which confirms this massive bite force. Uh, and, and people have also done experiments using pieces of bone that have been bitten by teeth and that you can work out the force required to drive the tooth into the bone. And it tends to agree with these kinds of calculated forces up to five or six tons of force. So these are the stories in my new book, Dinosaurs, New Visions of a Lost World. It's mainly about color, but I also touch on some of those other themes. So if you're interested in paleontology, if you like the new paleobiology, this is 
something very different from what I was taught, very different from what you will find in a lot of the popular books. This is the new world of scientific paleontology. Uh, and, and in the book, we go, I take you into the lab and we go right into the detail of how each of those dinosaurs was reconstructed. Uh, and we have the, the joy of these fantastic new artworks by Bob Nichols to illustrate what we're showing. So I think I will, I think that's the end. So thank you for your attention. I will stop sharing and go back to the, um, go back to the uh, main screen. And I shall be ready for questions. I'll, I'll let John, I can see the chat, but I'll let John look thank after you. the questions. So thank you all very much. Fascinating talk, really enjoyed that. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, yeah, a couple of questions from the uh, Zoom uh, audience. For, one from Mark. Um, can melanosomes be found in fish scales and how far back in time have they been traced? That's a great question, and I don't immediately know the answer. So we do know of, of course, melanin is universal throughout life. So it's found in all groups of animals, many groups of plants. It's found in fungi. Um, I can't recall whether in fish scales the color, so many of the color patterns in fishes are indeed melanin, there's no question. Whether it is encapsulated within mel melanosomes or simply within the layers of the scale, I can't quite remember. I need to check that. But people are reconstructing colors of fossil reptiles and fossil fish using melanin. And I think uh, it, you, you can determine the different types of melanin from partly from the residual color, but mainly from chemical analysis, because chemically, pheomelanin has a different chemical signature than eumelanin. Thank you very much for that. Um, one from Kieran here. If, uh... Pterosaur fuzz is true feathers and they shared a common ancestor with dinosaurs. Do you think this suggests that the earliest dinosaurs had feathers as well? Yes, that's another great question. I, I didn't show that part of it. So I have another talk where I talk about the evolution of feathers. Um, and indeed, the fact that we have identified all kinds of feathers in many different groups of dinosaurs, um, particularly within theropods, and, and the, there's all the different kinds of feathers we see in birds are known in different fossil dinosaurs, plus many others. So the interesting thing is the, the theropods with feathers also had types that we don't see in birds. And there's no reason that they should all have survived to the present day, of course. And then for those of you who know the shape of the family tree of dinosaurs, you'll be aware that Cetacosaurus uh, and Colinda Dromaeus and some of the other feathered dinosaurs, they're ornithischians, and they sit a long way from theropods and birds in the evolutionary tree. So there are no feathers known in sauropodomops, which is the third main group of dinosaurs, but we would say very likely feathers track back to the origin of dinosaurs back in the Triassic, so the answer to your question is yes. And if those pterosaurs also share feathers with dinosaurs, as we would argue, that's still quite controversial, we would say then the origin of feathers goes right back to the early Triassic, to the ancestors of pterosaurs and birds, in fact. And so we're waiting with excitement any day, any day, somebody will find a, a, an exceptional site of preservation of fossils in the Triassic uh, with uh, dinosaurs and pterosaurs. And let's see what they find. Will they find pycnofibers and or feathers, evidence of color? Well, I would say, yes, they will but that's yet to be proved. Thank you. Um, I'll leave Noah's um, question until last, because I think that's quite nice. Um, one from Lucy, how many colors can we now identify in the fossil record and can we see things like iridescence? Great question as well. So yeah. <clears throat> the, the two chemical types of melanin provide um, evidence of more than two colors. So of course, all those colors in mammals, like the ginger of the red squirrel, that's, that's pheomelanin, all the different human hair colors, um, and indeed, the more complex patterning that you see in zebras uh, and, and various antelopes and deer, all of that is one type of melanin, new melanin, just packed in different ways to give different intensities of color. The, thing, the colors we cannot determine, though, in birds are some of the dietary based colors like carotenoids and porphyrins. And so the pink color of a flamingo uh, comes from carotenoids, which are in the I think that's in the algae that the shrimps that they eat. There's some story like that. So if a flamingo has the wrong diet, 
it loses its pink color. And the purples and greens of certain ducks and other birds come from other foods that they eat. So those are the porphyrids. And those we're not very good at identifying yet, but I think people are hot on the trail. And some of those colors, carotenoids, for example, are also seen in fossil plants. So we're, people are working on chemical signatures of those. So I think colors in fossils ultimately will be unlimited. Uh, and, and we're finding smart ways of identifying those. That's it, thanks for that. And um, finally from Noah, Noah's been very busy today. He's come to, um, I think, most of the talks, but uh, Noah would love to know what is your favorite dinosaur? Thank you for your question, Noah. It's a very difficult question to answer because there are about a thousand species of dinosaurs already have been named. I'll, I'll cheat a little bit and I'll, I'll name two. I'll say Sinoceropteryx is, my, is really a favorite dinosaur. I love the fact that it comes from China and, and we've had hugely successful collaborations with researchers in China. This is one of the joys of modern paleontology that you can travel the world and work in a very friendly way with people from every nation on earth, every culture on earth and people travel and we have Chinese students and researchers in Bristol working with us and we go to China and work in the labs there. And of course the importance of Sinoceropteryx as the first ever feathered dinosaur, that is something. And all that story back from 1996, when it was first announced, it, it had such a big impact on the world in a historical way. And finally, it was, of course, the dinosaur in which we were the first to determine color. But I'll say my other favorite dinosaur is the Bristol dinosaur, which is called Thecodontosaurus, quite a mouthful, Thecodontosaurus, meaning socketed toothed reptile or dinosaur. And it's, it's, it's a favorite because it is the Bristol dinosaur, but also because it was the first dinosaur on earth ever named from the Triassic. Uh, it was named in 1836. So I think it was only about the fourth or fifth dinosaur ever named, ever named. Now we know a thousand dinosaurs. Back in 1836, we only knew three or four. And uh, Thigodontosaurus was named from bones and teeth and jaws found in quarries right within the city of Bristol. Uh, it was the very first dinosaur named from the Triassic. And so that extended the range because up to that <coughs> point, people had only named dinosaurs from the Jurassic and Cretaceous. So we needed to know about the origin of dinosaurs uh, uh, in the Triassic. And that's another subject that um, uh, has been a great favorite of mine. Thank you, Mike. Um, and just seems to be one more from uh, Joshua. Um, you'd like to know how many types of dinosaurs are there? It's a very difficult one to answer. I, I've used the number of a thousand. If you look at different places, you will find that, in fact, many more than 1,000 dinosaurs have been named uh, from 1824, when the very first one was named, up to the present day. And something like it's, people are naming a new dinosaur almost every week. It's about every 10 days, there is a new dinosaur species being named. And so although at one level, the answer is more than a thousand, we've actually found that lots of those dinosaurs that people named over the years, even naming them today, um, turn, turn out not to be really new species. They're, they're what are called synonyms, meaning that they have already been named but people are being a little bit over enthusiastic. They find a bone or a few bones and they think, wow, I found a new dinosaur. I'm going to give it a name. And then somebody else a few years later maybe says, no, nah, sorry, mate. You know, somebody else had already named it 20 years ago or 100 years ago. Or your fossils are just so scrappy. You've just got a couple of teeth. It's not enough. It's not enough to say for sure. So it's quite difficult to put your finger on it. But uh, I think the number is maybe about seven or eight hundred, probably, but they're going up at the rate of 30 or 40 new dinosaurs every year. So for younger people listening, um, by the time you are my age, by the time you're a grandfather, there truly will be a thousand dinosaurs named, I'm sure.